Welcome back to the PLC Professors Workshop. Today I want to discuss with you the single most important element or factor in programming programmable logic controllers, no matter what the brand is, almost no matter what the application is. And if you don't agree with this, then um, I'm not saying bad to you, I'm just saying that you shouldn't waste your time watching the rest of this video. The number one factor is the maximum number of good parts, components, products out the door from the manufacturer's facility. Remember that the PLC was created to facilitate faster upgrades in the process to manufacture parts. It was also created to facilitate quicker troubleshooting for the technicians and electricians. So if you don't agree that good parts out the door is not the most important factor of programmable logic controllers, uh, really you got no business being in this business. I know that sounds like I'm uh, being high and mighty or self-righteous, but I'm not. The goal is products out the door. And that means less downtime. Less downtime means that the systems can be trouble shot quicker and put back into production as quick as possible. And it's not just a matter of the people that are available to troubleshoot, which most of them, the, the good ones are really electricians who have picked up the skill of troubleshooting the processes with online monitoring of the PLC. So it's not about uh, how well you wrote the code necessarily, what code you use, what language you use. It all has to do is with how quickly can you determine what's wrong with the system and get it fixed. And 99 times out of 100 or 999 times out of 1,000, it's a sensor that's broken, a sensor that's been uh, come loose. It's a cylinder that's sticking and not making it to the end of stroke quick enough. All these things are found by monitoring the program in the PLC. So it all boils down to how easy is it to monitor the program. So let's jump in and start looking at some of this. How did the PLC happen? General Motors around 1968 actually started before then, but 1968 is the date that they throw down in history. And that was when Dick Morley and a group of engineers working at General Motors were dealing with the changeover that they had to go through every model year. So General Motors, back then, uh, they tended to change the sheet metal and the features on vehicles more quickly. In other words, every year they tried to come out with something that looked different, looked cooler, looked better, and all the rest. These changes in the manufacturing, because the parts changed, the sheet metal changed, everything changed, they had to completely reprogram the control systems. And back then they were all relays. And without laboring into that and talking about that, we'll just keep this simple. So before the PLC, control logic for manufacturing was mainly composed of relays, cam timers, and drum sequencers, and some dedicated closed loop controllers that might have been controlling temperature or speeds or something. And the hardwired nature of it made it difficult for design engineers to alter the automation process. Changes would require rewiring and careful updating of the documentation, insane all by itself. Often the technicians at General Motors would spend hours troubleshooting by examining schematics and comparing them to existing wiring. Now you gotta put yourself in that mindset back then. It's very difficult to do where you're looking at a set of prints. You don't even know if the panel was wired that way. Someone could have come in and moved a few wires around to correct a problem and not updated the print. It was bad news. When general purpose computers became available, they were soon applied to control logics and industrial processes. However, these early computers were unreliable, not industrially hardened, and required very special programmers. Now, Morley's genius, when he came up with a PLC, was to incorporate ladder logic into his system. Ladder logic is essentially a graphic representation of Boolean logic. This was the game changer. 
the engineers would find it easier to understand and use than they would Boolean logic. And so the first PLCs provided several advantages over earlier automation systems. The PLC would tolerate the industrial environment better than computers and was more reliable, compact, and required less maintenance than the relay systems. It was also extensible with additional I.O. modules. You didn't have to put in more relays, you just added more I.O. modules. So this allowed for easier iteration over manufacturing process design. With simple programming language focused on logic and switching operations, it was more user-friendly than computers using general purpose programming languages. It also permitted its operation to be monitored. They could go in and monitor the logic. Early PLCs were programmed in ladder logic which strongly resembled a schematic diagram of relay logic. This program notation was chosen to reduce training demands for existing technicians. And it turned out to be a lot more than that. You're probably, some of you are thinking that I'm an old geezer and I just kind of passed my, the pinnacle of my career and understanding of what's going on before structured text became available to program a PLC with. Well, let me straighten you out on that right away. I learned Fortran, which was a general purpose compiled imperative programming language before PLCs even existed. My first language was Fortran. And Fortran, if you look at an example here, and it's hard to find any examples for industrial control, but if you see it, it is a structured text. Now, a lot of people want to argue what structured text is, is, or not. But saying that this is not structured text would be like somebody who says, who drives a, a say, a Camaro, says that if you're driving an Impala, that's not really a Chevrolet. You gotta be driving a Corvette or a Camaro, otherwise you're not driving a Chevrolet. Well folks, this is structured text. And after Fortran, then I started using BASIC. And BASIC went through quite a number of improvements in its toolbox and everything else, and then moved to C. Now this language, C, looks more like modern structured text than BASIC or Fortran. Nonetheless, these are structured text languages. Okay, so um, I don't have a dog in this fight, so to speak. I learned structured text long before I ever heard of a PLC. My, I was writing programs in text-based language. And um, I never even saw ladder logic for a PLC until long after I was doing lots of control engineering I wasn't really programming PLCs, I was doing the, uh, the electrical design, you know, which used a lot of relays and timers and uh, drum sequencers, what have you. So I kind of went through the full iteration of, you know, what's led up to now. And let me ask you a question, a real simple question. You've heard it said that a picture tells a thousand words, okay? So let's say I took a photograph didn't show it to you, and in that photograph there were a number of objects that you would quickly recognize, including the colors and the brands and the gender, one story, two story, woods in the back, beach in the back, etc. So let's say I took a photograph and wrote a thousand words, and I put those thousand words in front of you, sat it down in front of you, and nicely written and laid out, not trying to trick you, and then said, what color is the car in the image? How long do you think you would have to read before you found the color of the car? And you couldn't just look for the word car. You would have to see the word, the noun car, with adjectives after it or before it to see that it's a red car. But if I showed you the photograph, how quickly could you tell me what color the car was? Um, unless there's something wrong with you, probably in less than one second, you look at it and say, oh, it's a red car. And then if I went back to the text and said, now, now that you've seen the photograph, you've taken in that image. My point is a picture tells a thousand words and any graphic language beats text-based language hands down for how quickly you can analyze it and read it. 
but there's more to it than that. Let's look. What I have here in front of me is I've opened a project in Connected Components Workbench. I picked this software package to do the demonstration with because it has a simulator. So I don't need any hardware. And I own all but one of the uh, family of Micro 800 controllers. It's not my favorite, but it's becoming more popular, so I decided to use it. Typically, I write most of my projects in RS Logic Studio 5000 Logic Designer for compact logics with panel views, variable frequencies, drive, servo, control, and everything. So, what I have here are some uh, program files where I have the same logic in both structure text and in ladder logic diagrams. So, Let's look at the most obvious one, and that would be the if-then-else. I'm really addressing this more to people who program in structured text than I am people who program in ladder logic diagram and are considering learning structured text. And I certainly encourage everyone to learn everything you can. But this is something you need to strongly think about. The most important thing in manufacturing regarding PLC programming is how quickly it can be troubleshot and put back into production making money. There are a lot of machines showing up now out in the industry that have structured text for the main sequential functions of the machine and the machine breaks down say three four months after it was delivered its commission. Uh, the company has paid the machine builder and they're long gone. And then something happens at three o'clock in the morning maintenance guy goes out there and he opens up CCW or whatever program he's got and he opens up the program and he sees structured text. Well, <laughs> even if he can read structured text, there's, got, there's some other issues of whether or not you can monitor it while it's running. If you're a structured text guy, I'm encouraging you to learn ladder logic diagram as fast and quickly as you can because once the manufacturers the people who purchase these machines start realizing that machines that show up with structured text are going to cause them a problem because the maintenance guys can't troubleshoot it or even if they can't it's slower to troubleshoot they're going to start telling companies not to send machines with structured text now using structured text for little routines for math and maybe some loop control or something that's great but for the main sequence of the program no. So they're going to start refusing machine builders. Now I realize what's going on with the machine builders. There's not enough controls engineers to go around. So they're taking people right out of school that have no electrical background, no industrial control background, but can write structured text. Because you can write this structured text in IDE, right in a Arduino or a Pi, Raspberry Pi, and then port it over. That doesn't address the fact that it's harder to troubleshoot and there aren't many people to troubleshoot it. So the machine builders are between a rock and a hard place. They can't deliver the equipment because they can't find controls engineers that can write ladder logic because that's what the companies want that are buying the machine because that's what's going to get them back up into production the fastest, fastest when something breaks down the field. Okay, now if we look at the strain, and so y'all are that are writing structured text and not ladder logic diagrams, your paycheck is going to suffer. The, the folks, male and female, that can do both, specifically write ladder logic diagrams, are going to be able to call for higher paychecks, for higher hourly rates, higher salaries, because they can deliver what the customers want. So here's a simple piece of structured text. You got a couple if then statements and I picked these on purpose because I'm going to compare it to ladder logic diagrams. So it says if input 1 then output 9. True. So basically it's saying if input 1 is on then turn on output 9. Otherwise or else turn off output 9. So this is if input 1 is on turn on 9. Output 9. If it's off Turn off output 9. This one says, if input 0, then turn on 8. That's the end of it. This one says, if not input 0, then turn off 8. So this if then else up here does the same basic thing as these two down here. This turns it on and this turns it off. So let's look at the ladder logic. This says, if I'm trying to use different addresses to make this easier to compare when we actually run this on a PLC. So here we had 
if input one, then turn on nine. Otherwise, turn it off. Then here we have if input zero, then turn on eight. If not input zero, turn off eight. We go over here. If input one, then turn on output 11. This particular instruction right here, it's called a coil or an output energize. It has a true and a false execution. So if this is true, if input one is on, or turn on output 11. If it's off, then turn off. See, it's a real simple statement. These two down here, this has a true and a false execution. If the rung's true, if the statement's true, turns it on. If the statement's false, turns it off. These, if the rung is true, or the this, this statement is true, it turns it on. But if the statement goes false, it does nothing. There's no else. Whereas this one, if the rung is true, then it turns it off. And if it's false, it doesn't do anything. These two sets of code right here, this and this, are identical. They have the exact same function. I picked different outputs simply so we could see them operate when we open up the simulator. Now I have another example here, and it's uh, called case, and we have three cases over here. I see I'm missing one, so I'm going to double click on that and bring that in. I have to open this up a little bit. This is the one I wanted to look at first, though, because if you're a structured text person, then you're, you immediately recognize it. So this is saying, and I'm um, elucidating or elaborating on the text, uh, the case of state is a variable, it's an integer. So in the case of state equaling one, then you see four statements there, turn on output zero, turn off one, two, and three. However, if the state is two, then turn off zero and on one and off two and three. Now the reason you have to do this is because whatever you tell that output to do, it'll stay in that state until you tell it otherwise. So in each state, you have to tell what output is on and which ones are off. So you, and I put zero part way down just to show you. Now, logically, I would put zero at the top, then one, two, three, four, just because it makes it, you know, more, it makes it easier to read. Now, the same thing in ladder logic would look like this. Now, remember that I'm using a type of instruction that says it's on, but there's no else. So it's just saying, turn on zero, turn off one, two, and three. So in each case, it's turning on one thing and turning off everything else. And then for zero, I have, if the state is zero, then just turn them all off. Okay, so now we go back to the ladder logic. It takes a little, up a little bit more space on the page. I mean, I can geezer it down, you know, to get more of it on the page to make it more readable. But I wanted to show it specifically like this. So this is an equal instruction. So it says if the state is equal to one, then turn on four, turn off five, six, and seven. And all of these statements are all the same. If the state is equal to a particular value, then do this. In this case, it's uh, turn off four, uh, turn on five, and turn off six and seven. All the way down the bottom, if you're in state four, then turn off four, five, and six, and turn on seven. Now there's an easier way to do this, because remember, these instructions don't have a true and a false execution. It's true only. So if we go to another example, which is actually simpler, if the value of state, the integer, if it's one, equal to one, then turn on, I'll put 12. If it's not equal to one, then it turns it off. So this replaces a little bit more uh, beefy looking thing and they both accomplish the exact same thing you know there are people that look this just say it's a complicated mess and I'm looking at it and thinking how is that possible this is like an electrical diagram and over here this vertical bar that's plus 24 volts and this is zero volts these are individual circuits between plus 24 and zero now we're not really doing voltage and current switching and load but it's symbolic so it has linear logical conductivity. Whereas if you look at this, you don't see any logical conductivity. As a matter of fact, you have to sit and read it a bit to picture that. But let's, let's keep this simple. So I downloaded this to the PLC. So I'm going to connect 
So now we're ready to download this to the controller. And remember, I told you I'm not using a controller, I'm using a simulator. So I go up here to this button, Start Micro 800 Simulator. It brings it up on the screen. A simulator, I'll just move it over a little bit. Um, maybe I can scrunch this up a little bit. So I've got it all on the screen, everything I need uh, for what we want to do. That a PLC has memory and has firmware, etc. Your laptop, your desktop, it has memory, it has firmware, etc. So a simulator takes a section of the memory in your computer, your laptop or desktop, and mimics the memory structure and everything in a particular micro 800. Now in this case, there's only one model that you can use for the simulator, it's a micro 850. What separates this is these input terminals right here, if you want to operate, and you, you can just click here and turn on input zero, and then any outputs are turn on, these will light up down here. So let's do that. Now I'm going to connect, and it just so happens, well, I try to connect, but you know what? I forgot to turn this on, so I'm gonna turn it on first. Even though I started the simulator, I didn't actually power it up. So right now it's powered up and you can see it said connection failed that's because I try to connect before I powered it up I have to do connection path I needed to get it right here and we're not going through how to set up the simulator this could be a real piece of hardware okay so now we want to connect now that we have a path see up here I didn't have a path in there I do now so I have started the process of connecting and we're going to go online let's go back to the if then else structured text okay so you recognize this and then right next to it we had the ladder logic diagram now notice right away that you see red and blue blue from here over means false here it means on and whenever you see the text that text will be read if that bit memory is on and if the rung is true, like this one, you know, the instruction is true because input zero is off. The rung is true, and this turns off output 10. So if I turn on input zero, now watch here, input zero is on. Now look, now there's 8 and 10 both came on because I have other code in here that's also using input zero which happens to be your structured text. So, see, if input zero, then turn on eight. So you see eight is on here. Okay, now when you look at that structured text, do you see any hint whatsoever of what's true or false? Forget, the, forget this guy over here, because you're not gonna have this to look at. You can open up the doors of the panel electrical panel and you can go look at the PLC the controller and you can see LEDs lit up here so you could see the same thing but what you're not going to see is this you're not going to have this to look at you don't have a clue of what's true or false on or off here and you're online right now this is not offline I'm online okay so let's turn off input zero and you can see that the logic changes if I went here and said why isn't what's on and what's off you don't have a clue but if you go here you can see that nothing's on go back here you have no clue now let's take something a little bit more complicated let's do a case okay we looked at this a little bit early and I'm online now this is running okay so if I were to turn on input zero and I'm gonna go do that right now no I'm going to change the state. Okay, now to do that, I would have to right-click on state here, variable monitoring, and I'd have to go in there and change this to a 1. Hit enter. Do you see anything change here? Look close. Now let's go over to the same logic, but in ladder logic. Well, yes, you see right away. I'll put 4 is on, and when you look down through these equal statements, these are all blue, right? and only one of these is red that means the statement is true and it's turning on output 4 now if we change the state remember how we did it in the structure text we kind of right clicked on it and picked variable monitoring now in ladder logic diagram you would st simply click right there any place that you saw any place where it says state and we'll pick 0 
that'll put it back kind of where it was. And now you see this is true and it turns them all off. So if you go here, you can't tell what's true or false. You don't have a clue. Go here, you look and say, oh, I got a true wrong. And it's turning all those off. Now there's another way to do this logic that's more straightforward, and that's this one. And again, remember, I'm using different outputs. So when you look at the simulator, you're going to see different outputs come on based on what inputs I turn on. Now for the state logic, it's going to be, if I put this in state 1, logical value, 1, enter, notice what came on. 0, 4, and 12. So here's 12. Remember we've got two different examples of this logic. This one, which uses the set reset, or uh, these instructions have a true execution, no false execution. So I can use this instruction to turn the bit on, but I can't turn it off. If I want to turn it off, I have to use a reset, set and reset, latch and unlatch. So in this case, I'm using the state, I'm using that integer variable in all three of these examples here. Now in this one, if I pick a different state, and I'm going to show you something interesting here. I'm going to go to zero. And you notice that they go off. Uh, let's do something slightly different. Let's um, make this four and you can see the fourth one turns on remember I have three different examples here I've got 12 13 14 15 I've got four five six seven and I've got zero one two three but let's change it to something that's not accounted for like five notice that this one turned off because there is no statement that says if the state equals 5, then do something. These other two, this one doesn't have, it can't do a 0. See right here? No, you would have to have a 0 to turn them all off. But in this case, if you don't have a state that matches any of these, then they're all off because this is a, would be like a then else. In other words, it has a true and a false execution. The point here is, that when you're looking at this, you don't have a clue what's true, false, on, or off. Now you can you can right-click and go to variable monitoring, and you can go and look and say, "Oh, that one's off." You can go down here and say, "Well, three's on." And now you're trying to relate that to something up here. It just doesn't work. So the bottom line is, there's no way in the world you can troubleshoot structured text as quickly and easily as ladder logic diagram. Now there was a time when I think Rockwell had animated structure text, so the variables changed color, but that still did not define a true and false continuity in the structure of the code. If you're writing ladder light, or if you're writing structure text programs for machine control, uh, just be warned that there will come a time if you continue to do it, where it's going to come back on the company you're working for from their customers saying we don't want any more. Now they're going to be looking for somebody that could program a ladder logic diagram, or even more important, and this is where it could be to your advantage. If you learn ladder logic diagram programming right now, get at it, then you can be someone that can convert structured text to ladder logic diagram for the sake of reducing downtime. Bottom line, you need to learn ladder logic diagram if you're going to do machine control. And if you don't understand the electrical nature, you know, this is your power bar over here on the right, and this is your neutral bar on the left. If this electrical nature doesn't, um, you don't understand it, then you don't know enough about electricity, industrial electrical controls to even be fooling around writing programs for industrial control. Now, it sounds harsh, but I'm trying to do you a favor here. If you're doing structured text programs right now, I'm not telling you to stop. I'm just telling you to learn ladder logic diagrams and start switching over because the day is going to come where the people who can do ladder logic diagrams are available to work for machine builders are going to get paid more money than structured text. Now here's a case where it's a little bit more complicated. I showed you real simple examples, but this is a more complex example of structured text. 
real easy to read. It says if this is the first program scan, then set these variables to these values. In other words, step, set I step to zero and this variable to zero and then turn off these three bits. They're, bi they're binary, booleans, and if. Now, case of I step equaling zero, see up here it says I step equals zero. So you start here, it initializes the value of all these variables and then it sets I step to 10 immediately. So you go to 10 here and you've got these, uh, they're, they're not difficult to read, but if you're trying to troubleshoot and you can't see the value, if you can't see what's true or false, you're going to end up wandering around in here because it's really spaghetti code. Now it starts out pretty straightforward. Sets it the state to 10, 10, blah, 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 set it to 15. However, if this wasn't true, then you got else if this, then this. Else, so they're nested an if then inside of an if then. That's spaghetti code. Very difficult to follow. So you're not going to be able to follow this, period. Then you've got here, you go to 15. Oh, look, let's say that this is an else. You go to step 700. And that's way down here. So you're jumping across a bunch of code. I never do jump to labels in my code. That's just too much spaghetti code. So if you look down through here, imagine all this. You're trying to read through this and find out what is and what isn't, what's on, what's off, what's true, what's false. And there's not a clue here. Okay, I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom. That's a lot of stuff to scroll through trying to figure out what's going on. This is not an iPhone app where you've got thousands or, you know, a million people using it. So you've got a big user base to get the thing debugged. This is an industrial machine. The reason I sound a little harsh in this discussion is because I'm in the process of converting this over to ladder logic diagram because the customer that bought the machine is out in the boondocks. Something happened. It got locked up. Couldn't find anybody to troubleshoot the program primarily because it was structured text and then since they couldn't find anybody to troubleshoot it then they called me and I took one look at it and I says well I'll be honest with you I'm going to convert this over to ladder logic diagram otherwise you're going to be back in the same situation again next time it doesn't function you're going to be looking for somebody to work on it if I sound a little rough I'm still dealing with the frustration of this project and I don't see any end to it. I see more and more of this showing up out on the factory floor. Have a great day.